It was the era of the New Deal, the golden age of Hollywood, big bands. The year is 1936, Chicago, Illinois. Disenfranchised by what Con Selmer had done with drum manufacturing after buying Ludwig drums, William F. Ludwig had opened his own drum shop, but was just reminded by Con Selmer that they still own the Ludwig name. So Bill Sr. changed the name of his new shop to WFL, and he and his new factory could then put out drums that met the high manufacturing standards he had intended all along, which Kahn had neglected over the last few years. Some of the more historically significant drums produced during this time, unfortunately rather rare these days, included the twin and single strainer sensitive models. The twin strainer model is equipped with a system that is split into two independently adjustable throws, one with 10-strand sensitive coiled wire snares, what we know today as snappy snares, and one with six-strand wire-wound silk snares, which according to the catalog could be swapped out for gut upon request. This results in four possibilities for snare engagement. Off, for a standard tenor drum option. Silk wound only, a very dry sound. Snappy only, full and tonal. Both silk wound and snappy together, fat yet crisp and articulate. The legend goes that William Sr. had filled up his station wagon with a bunch of these twin strainer snare drums, marketed as Ray Baduke Dixieland and Swing twin strainer snare drums, made with Ludwig's classic three-ply mahogany poplar mahogany in a natural finish or various pearl wraps, or all metal shell. This particular drum would be the 405 model with nickel over brass triple flanged hoops. According to one catalog, the Ray Duke Dixieland model has wood hoops and the swing model comes with full flanged hoops. The illustration looks similar to today's die cast hoops. The 1937 and 39 WFL catalogs, however, show the triple flanged hoops as standard for the Dixieland and later Dixieland swing models with a wood hoop upgrade option. This drum came from its original owner out on Cape Cod, and although there's no way to ever know for sure, I like to entertain the idea that it's very likely one of the drums that William F. Ludwig himself had hauled in his station wagon in that famed trip from Chicago to New England in the late 1930s.
Here's the drum as I received it. It's got some dust inside and out, pitting and rust on the metal, and the white marine pearl wrap is severely yellowed and faded and crusty. This Liar badge is the first badge variant in the WFL line, which dates this drum to about 1937. Moving on from the badge, we can take a look here at the namesake Twin Strainer. One of the throws was missing an adjustment screw, and the strainer assembly as a whole wasn't really in great condition and needed a little work. The butt plate has two independently adjustable adjacent clamps for the dual snare wires. Both sets of snare wires have a decent amount of rust and were pretty badly bent in some places. By the way, note the tasteful engraving on the clips of the coiled wire snare strand with WFL elegantly enclosed in a diamond shape. This end of the coiled wires had a modern snare cord attached to it, which wasn't tied securely and made me wonder if that was either a result or a cause of the missing adjustment screw. At the other end though, it did come with what I imagine is one of the original snare cords. No way to really tell, but this looks pretty old. At this end, we can see the loose ends of the three silk-wound snare strands. Over on the throw-off end, we see how the silk-wound strands get threaded through the strainer. If you've ever wondered why older strainers had offset holes at the bottom, it wasn't just for arbitrarily tying cord through the holes of your choice. The diagonal holes were actually quite functional. Back in the days of silk-wound and gut-string snares, each wire was folded halfway and then threaded through these holes. The holes were diagonal top to bottom to ensure that the strands would be spaced evenly when stretched across the drum. Later, snare wires welded to clips and secured with cord became the standard around the middle of the 20th century. Yet, much to the bewilderment of drummers young and old, Ludwig continued to produce a strainer with these unnecessary holes all the way into the 1980s before finally modifying the ubiquitous P85 to use the more modern clamp-style strainer we know and love today, or at least love to hate. I like these tension rods. They have attitude, very thick neck compared to their modern counterpart. This is just the old magnet test to see which metal parts are steel and which are brass. Nothing unexpected here. Most of the threaded parts, like the damper knob and tension rods, are steel and magnetic, and the lugs and hoops are not magnetic and thus plated brass. And in case there was any doubt about the hoops being brass, there's a little plating coming off on the batter side hoop, revealing some rather nicely patinaed brass. The plating on these lug casings is a little weird. It's not smooth and shiny like other chrome or nickel plating of the era, and it's unlike other metal parts of the drum. It has a dull luster and even some bubbles, but it's definitely not paint. The interior has a brand mark for Century Die Casting Company. Taking a peek at the interior, we see a rough inner ply of mahogany and solid maple reinforcement rings, and of course Ludwig's well-known bearing edge of a 30-degree inner cut and a generous roundover outer cut. These oversized screw heads are rounded and beefy, and have patinaed to an almost pewter color. The snare beds are narrow and deep, typical of WFL and older Ludwig wooden snare drums. They appear to be hand-tooled and perfectly done, with a smooth contour transition into the bearing edge. Here's a look at the wrap with the drum undressed. The contrast from the previously covered parts shows the extent of yellowing and fading throughout the rest of the exposed pearl finish. 